Ongare amgara tinaram dasha ganangana sadaka chaksudun militam yana tashmai sri gravelama si chetanimano vistam stapitam yana bhutare soyam rupa karamayam darati so parantikam vande ham si guru si ata parakamalam shri gurun vaishnavam sha si rupam sagatam sahagana raganatam bitam stam sadevam sadvaitam sabadutam parijana saitam krishna chetanya devam Sri Krishna, Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana, Ladita Sri Vishakan Vitam Stam. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinu Bandhu Jigadpate, Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute. Jayatam Surito Pango Mama Manir Matirgati Matsavisha Padam Boja, Radha Ramadan Mohanam, Sri Man Rasa Rasa Rambi Vamsi Bada Karsan Pinashinu, Gopina Asri Aisaram, Divyad Bindaranya Kapadrum Bada, Sri Madhradna Kadashima Shanishto, Sri Sri Sarada Sila Govindir Prasadabhi Seva Manush Marami, Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Taya Cha Jikari Taya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namam, Mangalang Bhagavan Vishnu Mangalam Guru Raja Cha Mangalam Bharidi Kaksho Mangalaya Tanu Hari, Om Narayana Om Narayanaya Vidmahi Vasadevaya Vidmahi Tano Vishnu Pachodya Tehim Om Mahadevi Chavidnihi Vishnu Padnichidimi Tano Lakshmi Pachodya Tehim Mahadakshmi Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Sareya Sari Hari Piriya Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Danadireim Tapta Kanjana Gaurangi Rade Vindavanishri Vishavana Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Piriyam Namah Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutane Shemiri Bhakti Padanta Shami Tanamani Ministe Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesa Sunyipari Praskita Desara Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Albaita Giradhar Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Welcome everybody to Wisdom Wednesday We're especially fortunate this morning to have as our guest, Chaitanya Charan, my hero of, of devotion. He's visiting Utah on a tour, de, to, on a, during a tour of the United States. He, he was here last night and gave a presentation on the relevance of the Bhagavad Gita, which was very well received. He'll be back tonight to give that part two. And he kindly agreed to join us on our ongoing discussion of the Atmarama verse here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Thank you very much for joining us, Chaitanya Charan. Thank you very much, Charu, for inviting me. It's such an honor to have your association. And you're one of the biggest inspirations on the on presenting bhakti in an affirmative, uplifting way, where we focus on more on what Krishna can do through us rather than how. Uh, the world is just a place of distress without Krishna. So, yeah, this Atmaram verse is also very, very apt. Somehow it has worked out for the discussion because you know, it highlights the difference between two conceptions of spirituality uh, which have been prominent in Indian, Indian thought systems. And we could say they have also been prominent in, within our movement. To some extent. This was originally spoken by uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Sarvamamancharya and then later to Sanatan Goswami. Yes. What's your understanding of how this verse is so pivotal to the missionary work of Krishna consciousness? Yes, true. So I'll talk of it from first the historical perspective, then the textual perspective from the Bhagavatam, and then maybe lastly from the the con contemporary perspective. So historically, while bhakti has always been given in the Vedic texts, it became prominent influence in India uh, from the time of Ramanuja onwards. So the 10th, 11th century. And by the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, bhakti had become the prominent form of spirituality in India. And Therefore, Srimad Bhagavatam also had become a very important scripture. Now, if you look at Indian history from the 7th, 8th century onwards, when Sripad Shankaracharya started um, uh, establishing Advaita Vedanta as a means to unite the broad Vedic paths and to drive away the nihilistic influences of Hinduism, uh, of sorry, of Buddhism, not Hinduism. So, what had happened was much of Indian spirituality had become largely impersonalist. 
so there was almost like a disconnect between the elite the intellectual elite who were all impersonalists and the masses who just connect couldn't connect with impersonalist ideas and they wanted some some practical things to do some devotion some worship some some practices so what happened was bhakti was becoming increasingly influential and therefore the impersonalists initially they just neglected bhagavatam they said this is just a this is just a bhakti scripture but after some time the impersonalists realized that this book has become too important for us to neglect and they tried to interpret even the bhagavatam in an impersonalist way and while there are some verses in the bhagavatam which could be read impersonally now of course they can be read personally also and i'll talk about the ambiguity later but the point is this verse is central to not only you could say ref, not only giving monistic or impersonalistic readings of the bhagavatam a uh, a knockdown but you could say a knock out <laughs> <laughs> a thorough thrashing <laughs> yeah it's so this verse what it says is the purpose of uh, of uh, spiritual growth within the impersonalist understanding is to become atmaram self satisfied that one becomes completely detached from the world and becomes absorbed in oneself and the idea is the atma and brahma are non different so atmaram also in that context means one one becomes immersed in brahman one becomes one with brahman and one doesn't have any further aspiration one one doesn't see anything existing apart from oneself at all so but what this verse is atma rama shya munayo so there are many munis but even those munis even those sages who have come to the level of atma ram nirgrantha api urukrame now each of this this verse can have many meanings but there is one straight reading and we could say the most literal reading and still they are attracted to many things nirgrantha they have no worldly attachments so nirgrantha in one sense is a compliment to atma ram so it's clearly describing imper- uh, spiritualists who have attained impersonal perfection atma rama shamun nirgantha and api even such people urukrame and to that lord who performs wonderful activities now urukram can refer to a particular activity of the lord where he stepped over covered the th- all the three worlds with his three steps or it can in general refer to the lord who come performs wonderful activities so kurvanti ahitu kim bhaktim itham guta bhuta guno hari so such that the lord is so wonderful his qualities are so wonderful that itham bhuta guno hari such are his qualities that that even these self satisfied sages who are unattached feel inspired to render service to him which is unmotivated so now the ahituki is important because ahituki bhakti indicates that they have not come from the spiritual level to the material level down suddenly they have developed some worldly desires mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that they are still purely motivated and they are serving him out of love for him so so the normal understanding if you consider like a hierarchy there is uh, the impersonalist understanding is bhakti is for less intelligent people till they come to the level of jnana and they understand that the bhakta and the bhagavan are just both one as brahman but here what it is saying is those who have come to that level they are practicing they practice bhakti and they practice pure bhakti such is the wonderful uh, qualities so the wonderful qualities of the lord so this completely inverts the impersonalist thesis so that's why it's not just a knockout knockdown but a knockout Because actually the you know you it there's so many precedents for the impersonalists actually having achieved the perfection of their practices that they are the ones who fall down to the mundane level and yet we've never had a devotee a pure devotee give up devotional service for impersonalism isn't that the fact yeah that's true you know it daksha vi mukti mane aur try just to i don't have to change up but it says the intelligence of those who try to become one with the lord is is clouded 
And although they can separate themselves from people in general by dint of penances and austerities and philosophical acumen, eventually, for lack of having taken shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, they just get bored and restless, hovering as a particle in the Brahma Jyoti. And, and mm. it is the impersonalists who actually fall down, not the personalists, isn't it? Yeah, that is true. It is one who has attained the Lord and love for him. There is nothing, there's anything, there's no conception of anything higher. Therefore, there's no question of leaving the Lord for anything else. So, this Bhakti will, is scriptural. Yeah. Would you say Bhakti is scriptural? Bhakti is firmly established in the truths of the Vedas. And what I think the impersonalists fail to understand is that Krishna is in fact described throughout the Vedas as that supreme personality, that supreme individual from whom all other individuals and individual qualities come. Could you expand on that topic? This, the, the Vedic conclusion that God is a person and from that person all other individuals come. Oh, okay. So, see, somehow the two things here in the Ved Vedic scriptures itself, like if you consider the Vedas, they are mostly karma kandi. With all due respects, they are mostly talking about rituals by which you can get elevation, gratification. Now, the Upanishads, they are a, uh, that uh, they are a, they are a very broad body of literature, and some of them do emphasize the idea of oneness with God. So, and there are others which do talk about bhakti. So the, the question that comes for anybody who is studying the Upanishads or studying the broad body of Vedic literature, you know, that there are statements which are impersonal sounding and there are statements which are personal sounding. So how are these two to be reconciled? And uh, now depending on which statements are prioritized, Somebody can say that is what is important. So what Shankaracharya did was he took certain statements which he called as the Mahavakyas. I am Atma Brahma or something like Tattvamasi, statements like that. And these were all statements which emphasized the oneness of the Jiva with Brahma. And he said these are Mahavakyas and everything else is a Laghu Vakya. It's all subordinate. And in that way, he used or he took the Vedic literature and used a particular interpretative framework by which the Vedas taught, at least he claimed that the, that the Vedic literature's conclusion was impersonalism. Now on the other, and he said that, okay, there are verses which talk about Krishna being supreme, about the absolute ultimate absolute reality being personal. He says, yeah, this is all lower reality. So he called it, this is Laghu Vakya. This is meant for people who have not realized the ultimate reality. So now Ramanujacharya and subsequent Acharyas from uh, after Shankaracharya, they, uh, sorry, after Ramanujacharya, they all have critiqued Shankaracharya's approach. Because first of all, this idea of categorizing uh, scripture into Maha and Laghu Vakya with primary, uh, superior and inferior statements, you know, what is the basis for that? And what is the basis on which these particular statements are declared as supreme, as superior. Uh, not just superior, but supreme in one sense. So, and moreover, the problem with this approach is that the vast body of scripture is highly personalist. Because there are so many prayers in scripture. There's the idea of a higher deity whom we are to worship. So, it's almost like 97, we could say more than 90, 95% of scripture is centered on worship of a personal divinity. And so the majority of scripture is reduced to, to an inferior status. And a small section of scripture is elevated to the superior status. So that was their primary uh, tool for refutation. There are many other ways also they refuted. But now when it comes to uh, acknowledging the, that there is an impersonal aspect of the divine and that there can be oneness with the divine. Now, this is where the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition is, we could say, uh, quite inclusive. If we consider the pen, a pendulum, the Advaita Vedanta said that, that the ultimate reality is only impersonal. Personalism is an illusion. 
and so the so the bhagwan is an illusion meant to take us to brahman now if we take the pendulum that's advaita vedanta and we have the opposite end of the pendulum is dvaita vedanta which was propagated by madhvacharya who came after ramanujacharya and what madhvacharya said is that actually there is no such thing as brahman it is brahman is vishnu that means that actually the idea that there is anything impersonal now i don't want to uh, reduce the complexity of madhvacharya's teachings but he basically said that there is no idea of oneness because everything is different he says god and nature are different god and living beings are different one thing in nature another thing in nature is different one living being another living are different so the idea of oneness itself he says that's an illusion that there is two realities there's never one now if we consider these are the two extremes of the pendulum maha chaitanya mahaprabhu's teachings are in between achinta bheda bhed so we accept that the ultimate ultimate reality has a impersonal aspect and we accept that the ultimate reality has a personal aspect and we accept that both are eternal not that one is an illusion like the impersonalist like the uh, followers of shankaracharya claim we accept both are eternal and this is where we could say there is some nuancing some small difference between uh, what shri prabhupad says and maybe what shri anachakar thakur or jiva goswami say all the prabhupad also says what jiva goswami says the words which you quoted aruya kruchena param padam tada so prabhupad explains that words to mean that even the even those who have attained impersonal liberation they fall back mm-hmm. whereas uh, shri anachakar thakur explains that words to mean that those who think they are liberated because manyate they think that that's there in the words that they are thinking that they are liberated they are not liberated because they don't have shelter of the law but chakravarti padan jiva goswami acknowledge that some people can attain the impersonal brahman and they can exist over there eternally they don't literally merge over there they can, the most people will not stay there but that is also a possibility so a rarity but a possibility so the point i'm making is our uh, chaitanya mahaprabhu's teachings our philosophy acknowledges both the reality of the impersonal aspect of the absolute and the reality of attaining that impersonal aspect simultaneously it uh, it clearly emphasizes that among the impersonal and the personal both the personal aspect is higher and attaining the personal aspect is much more fulfilling and this verse establishes that that it is possible to be atmaram this verse is not talking that the atmaram will fall down the atmaram have attained that state of being self satisfied they are detached from the world they are uh, and yet they are attracted to something higher so in one sense personal and impersonal both are teachings of scripture but the key question is which is higher and then what is lower how is that seen is the lower dismissed as a illusion is the lower dismissed as non existent or is the lower acknowledged also so that is what uh, the gaudiya vaishnava teachings are probably gives the example that when the space shuttles go out they seek to uh, where the space uh, ventures go out they seek to go to a particular planet and if they don't go to a particular planet they don't find shelter yes they don't land somewhere on solid terra firma they're condemned just to float uh yeah it's a good the, example yes. and eventually to come down eventually they all come down and yes. so aravindaksha means those who neglect or overlook taking the substantial shelter of the lotus feet of the lord now i just want to mention one quote that madhavacharya commented on it was when the yamadutas came back frustrated from having um been unable to take ajamil away from punishment and they came back to the court of yamaraj the lord of justice and death and they were kind of looking at yamaraj a little differently yamaraj understood what their um question was what their dilemma was and he said paro maranyat jagadash tantushtata o tam pratam patavam yatavaram up until now you have thought me to be the supreme because as the lord of death and as the lord of justice yamaraj knows everything about everybody in order to be fair and equal he knows every detail and therefore he could be said to be pretty much omniscient as far as the living entities in this universe are concerned but um here came 
into the bedroom of Ajamil, these effulgent, four-armed, um, uh, monsoon, cloud-colored living beings who stopped the Amadutas in their tracks, countervened the Amadutas' standing order to take away all sinful people for punishment, and outrageously told them that because Ajamil had just chanted one name of Narayan, almost unconsciously at the time of death, all of his sins were forgiven. <laughs> they couldn't understand that. So they went back and they were looking at Yamaraj differently and he said, no, he said, you, you have accepted me as a Supreme, but let me set you straight. I, Brahma, Shiva, Indra, Chandra, the demigods, up, down, the Prajapatis, the great sages, the demigods, the Marutas, the reptiles, the bees, every living being comes from Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in his commentary to that verse, Madhvacharya says that just like two threads, threads make up a cloth, and those threads go vertical and they go horizontal, similarly Krishna makes up the vertical and the horizontal reality of the entire creation. Could you comment on that? <laughs> I think you already explained fully that point. I don't think there's uh, anything more I can comment. But, uh, yeah. Well, I think it speaks to the to yeah. Chaita Abeda Beta Tatra. In, one, yes. in a, one sense, he's vertical. And in another sense, he's horizontal. So he covers everything up, down, right, yeah. and left. Yes, that is true. So that's why sometimes when people think of... Um, God, and I just when we say God is a person, that does not mean he's just a person in the ordinary sense that we think of. The God is a person who pervades all of existence. And in that if, if that concept is not understood, then people start thinking, you know, how can God be a person? And they start thinking that person that somehow personalism is a reductionistic kind of understanding where God's greatness is not acknowledged. So God is a person, but he's a transcendental person who, who also pervades all of existence. So I, the was, similar... thinking, I was thinking that the, you think Madhvacharya is referring to the all-pervasive Paramatma aspect of the Lord by describing him as the horizontal thread and the personality all the way up to Goloka Vrindavan as the vertical thread. Is that, is that That's beautiful. Valid, valid, do you think? Yeah. Uh, now we'll have to look at further writings of Madhvacharya, but it is it, it seems to be a quite a, a a devotionally creative and compatible reading. <laughs> yeah, certainly the super soul life pervades all of existence horizontally. And yes, the Bhagwan aspect is is more pers more fully manifesting the personality. Now Jiva Goswami in Sandarbhas gives a interesting explanation for the hierarchy of these three aspects of the absolute truth, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagwan. So why do we consider Bhagwan higher than Brahman? Is it just because we are personalists, so we consider him higher? He says, no. He explains that if we consider the ultimate reality, uh, the ultimate reality as Brahman is just existence. It's just existence. And in one sense, the Brahman does not do anything as Brahman. Because when they say the Brahman descends to this world, it is, they consider the lower level Brahman. So he says, Brahman is the, at the level of Brahman, we have perceived the ultimate reality without any energies. Mm. Mm -hmm. When we perceive the ultimate reality as Paramatma, now the Paramatma is primarily seen as the overseer of the material existence, the sanctioner the witness, the judge. So you see, the Paramatma is the ultimate reality with material potencies. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the Paramatma is, is manifesting something more than Brahman. And Bhagawan is the ultimate reality with not just material, but material and spiritual energies. Because uh, while Paramatma acts only in the material world, Bhagawan acts even in the spiritual world. Bhagwan can descend to the world, this world, and act in the material world also. So he has material potencies. Uh, or rather we can say he has potencies which can act in the material world. 
but Bhagwan also has spiritual potencies where he reciprocates love with his devotees. So it's not just our personal preference, our preference of personalism because of which we consider the personal aspect to be the highest. It is ontologically in terms of what all attributes are present. So Brahman is the ultimate reality with no energies. Paramatma is the ultimate reality with material energies. And Bhagawan is the ultimate reality with material and spiritual energies. In that sense, we acknowledge that all three are in one sense non-different. Because that's what Advaya Vadanti Tattapurita Tattvam Yad Gyanam Advayam Brahmeti Paramatmeti Bhagawan So they are Advaya, they are non-different. But at the same time, there is a hierarchy. So There's that verse in uh, third canto, I think it is Kapil, I believe, or Uddhava. He says, Yamarta lila payakam shoyagam uh, maya balam darshanagritam vishampanam swajja chashabhagaram param param bhushana bhushanagaram. It says that uh, when, when Krishna, in his form as Krishna, when the Lord descended in this material world, he attracted all living beings by his qualities. Um, mm. Even those who were puffed up, even those who were um, enamored with greed and material possessions like Duryodhana and Karna, they couldn't help but be impressed by the qualities and the opulences of Krishna. And then it goes on to say that even Vishnu, even Vishnu hankered after seeing the form of Krishna. Vishnu wasn't going to lose the opportunity that in as much as the original personality of God had, had descended in this material world, he wasn't going to miss up on the opportunity to get the darshan of Vishnu. And so therefore you have that pastime where he sold the sons of the Brahmins and uh, created a, an arrangement, a situation where Krishna was obliged to come and get his darshan. Yes. So, so now you're talking about hierarchy. I'm talking about the impersonal personal hierarchy. But now you're talking about the hierarchy within even the personal. Exactly. That, that there are there are many manifestations of personal divinity, and within that there is Krishna is the highest. Now it's interesting just to nuance this point further. In the Brihat Bhagavata Amrut, the supremacy or the supreme attractiveness of Krishna is clearly established when the Gopa Kumar goes from the earth to Vaikuntha, to Ayodhya, to Dwarka. Initially, he is delighted, but afterwards, he starts feeling discontented. And then finally, he descends to the Vrindavan on the earth and here practices Bhakti and then attains Goloka Vrindavan. That's where he feels completely contented. So, in that sense, Krishna and Vrindavan is the highest manifestation of divinity. Aradhyo Bhagavan Vajesha Tanayas Taddhama Vrindavanam as it says. Now, simultaneously, when he is in each of these abodes, the residents of Vaikuntha, Sadhana Goswami explains that they think of Vishnu as supreme. And they think that Vishnu is the source of all avatars. And Vishnu is the highest manifestation of divinity. And same in Ayodhya. The Ayodhya Vasis think Ram is the ultimate reality. Ram is the source of all avatars. And Sadhana Goswami does not put any anything in parenthesis or footnote. Oh, they are in illusion. They are wrong. No, he says, for them, if that is the form in which the Supreme Lord is manifesting his attractiveness, then for them, that form is the most attractive, the most fulfilling. So that, that's why it, it, it applies not just to the personal impersonal, it also applies to the objective and the subjective. So objectively, we can say Krishna is the highest manifestation of divinity. But subjectively, it could be that some devotees may find Ram or Vishnu to be the highest. And that is not to be denied. That is also to be accepted. Just like objectively among the five rasas, Madhurya Ras is the highest. But for Hanuman, in Dasya Ras, he is completely contented. Hanuman never thinks, oh, I want to be Sita. No. So in that sense, subjectively, Dasya Ras can be also supremely fulfilling for the person who is in Dasyaras. So that's why the Achintya Bhedavid also applies to the, uh, the objective hierarchy within the absolute reality, ultimate reality and the subjective experience of that hierarchy. And the two may be different. It says in the 10th canto, Gunatmanas, Krishna is Gunatmana. That means he's the soul of all qualities. There's, there's um, 
there's a quality about Krishna that will attract each and every living being based on where they are, based on the constitutional situation of their heart. When Krishna entered into the arena of Kamsa, for instance, there was, there was, he spoke something different to each and every person in that arena. You know, he, ca he entered into their hearts, he captured their attention, he won them over, each and every one, in a completely different way. There's no boilerplate Krishna. And that verse says that Krishna is this, not only is he an ocean of qualities, but whatever qualities there are had to have originated in Krishna himself. And it says that the scientists may one day know how many stars there are in the sky. They may know how many grains of sands there are on the beach. They may know how many atomic particles that constitute the universe, but they will never come to the end of the qualities of Krishna because as many living beings as Krishna creates, he has an intimate and unique relationship with each and every single one of them. Yeah. You know, this is, uh, this, is also, this is also one reason why people feel that some people have apprehension about a personhood because they feel like in this world that if, say, if person A loves B, then then B is no longer available for C. You know, <laughs> that's how many romance stories all centered on love triangles and the conflicts that come because of that. But Krishna is not like that. Krishna can be fully available for one gopi and he can simultaneously be fully available for another gopi. And while both gopis are attracted to Krishna, both of them, both are attracted to the same Krishna, they are attracted to different aspects of Krishna. And uh, you know, the Gopi Geet is the, considered often the highest expression of devotion of the Gopis. It's, it's an outpouring of their shattered heart when Krishna has left them and gone away while they had come to perform the Rasa dance with him. Now the song, the Gopi Geet itself is extremely beautiful. At the same time, Acharyas like Jiva Goswami have actually explained that each of these verses in the Gopi Geet are composed by different gopis. And they explain based on the knowledge of the gopis. Knowledge of which, which verse is composed by which gopi. So that, that the same point which you're making that Krishna has an individual relationship with each devotee. That each devotee is attracted in an individual way to Krishna with focuses on particular attributes of Krishna a particular dimension of that relationship with Krishna. So that is illustrated in this uh, in this reading of the Gopi Geet as each verse being composed by a different Gopi. And if someone, because people tend to be down and depressed and lacking in self-esteem nowadays, and question may arise, you know, there, I'm just one of six billion human beings on the planet, you know. What's special about me? Why would God care about me? Why would God even know of my existence? But the point is that he handcrafted you. He made you in a way that you're not like any other living being. You're one of a kind. You're a masterpiece. God doesn't make carbon copies. Every creation, every emanation from God is a unique individual to the point where we have free will, and then we can even turn around and ignore or deny God or decry God. That's, that's the extent to which Krishna creates us as independent, free-thinking, living beings. And he has a reason for that. He has a reason for that. There is the chance that we, get, we misuse our free will, we, get, we go astray, we create all kinds of sufferings and complications for ourselves. But the reason that Krishna creates us unique and with individuality is it so we can eventually come to the point of voluntarily re-entering our, our special, deep, relishable relationship with him. And he wants nothing more than that. Even though he's surrounded by millions and millions of uncountable living beings who are dedicated to his lotus feet, and he's fully engaged with them, fully absorbed in them, still there's one part of Krishna's consciousness which is aware of each and every one of us who are not with the program 
And because each and every one of us is created in such a way as to give something to that relationship of love that no other living being can give, Krishna misses us in a tangible way. And he'll never stop his efforts to try and bring us back home, back to God. And that's why when Gopa Kamar finally makes it back to the spiritual world, he makes it back, he appears in Goloka Vrindavan, if I'm not incorrect, towards the evening. And it's just that time when Krishna is returning, is it not, with the cows? Mm. And everybody's up on the rooftops trying to find out in that dust, where is the peacock feather of Krishna to know that he survived the day, he's okay, he's coming back to us. And Krishna, for his part, as he comes within vision of Vrindavan, he notices one person in the crowd who wasn't there yesterday. That's Gopa Kumar. So much did Krishna miss Gopa Kumar as an individual that he runs, he embraces him, he throws his arms around him, and then Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, being overjoyed to reunite with his long-lost devotee, faints. You imagine Gopa Kumar, he's there, he's, uh, he's, he can't believe that Krishna's embracing him, that Krishna actually was aware of his long surge in the material world. And not only that, but in, in his arms, Krishna passes out. Krishna loses consciousness. Now that should be a good antidote to anybody who's suffering from poor old, little old, me, I'm insignificant, I don't matter, Krishna doesn't even know I exist. And yes, Krishna knows you exist, he created you, and he created you to love you, and he won't rest until you get yourself back into the program, back to home, back to Godhead. Yes, that's true. Here also, I mean, that, that is one of the most moving pastimes. Sometimes we put it that Krishna, on seeing the Gopa Kumar, Krishna loses his Krishna consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Just, his consciousness is always Krishna consciousness. He loses Sarva Riyama, Saradam Riyama. Krishna is, Krishna is not Krishna consciousness. He's devotee conscious. <laughs> yes. It's yes, our Krishna. job to be Krishna conscious, but Krishna prefers to be devotee conscious. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> so two things, just one more point to illustrate, uh, uh, highlight in this, that there is a reason why some devotees may feel, some people may feel that, oh, I am just, as I said, one among mil billions of people who will Krishna care for me. And But the thing is, uh, Krishna has multiple circles of love. And Everyone is included in one of the circles of love. So yes, there are the gopis. We can say Radha and Krishna are in the innermost circle of love. Then there's another circle in which Krishna and the gopis are there. There's another circle in which say Krishna and his other pure devotees are there. There's another circle in which Krishna and his uh, sadhaka devotees are there. There's another circle in which Krishna and just all living beings are there. So Krishna is not just known as Bhakta Vatsala. Krishna is also known as uh, is also known as Bhakta Vatsala. Sorry, he's known not, not known just as Bhakta Vatsala. He is also known as um, Krupana Vatsala. Prahlad Maharaj says, Vaya se padano, that I pray to you, O Lord, you please de deliver me. Although I am fallen, Prahlad is taking the role of a conditioned soul. Although I am fallen, but you are also the you are also the lover of fallen people, a Krupana Vatsala. Those who are too self-centered, too miserly to love Krishna, Krishna loves even them. So we are. So yes, it is true that Krishna has his his intimate circle of love uh, with other uh, with others with some special devotees. But that does not mean we are not in a circle of love. We are in one of the circles of love, and as we start loving him more and more. Um, we will start entering into sweeter and sweeter or rather closer and closer, more intimate circles of love. But we are never unloved by God. 
This is actually this principle of reciprocity. What Krishna says, four eleven. Ye thamam prapadyante tam sathayo bajam yaham. But then the second part says, mama vartmanu vartante manusya partha sarvasha. While he says, I, recipro I am reciprocal, but I am also universal. Everyone is on my path. So it is not that. So everybody is in the circle of Krishna. Is in a circle of Krishna's love. I have a question, but let me just say that um, do, do we have time to encourage people? A lot of people have joined us on Zoom. We also have people on Facebook. Can I invite the people on Zoom to, in the chat, um, put forward a question if you want to in the last few minutes here? Yes, and let, yes, may I just share some of the comments on Facebook also and see if you have a reaction to them? Um, I have some very good comments from Britta from Ogden. Um, let me just scroll down here. Uh, Britta says here, in, intellectuals tend to impersonalize everything. She, she, she makes a good point. Impersonalism is, a, is the, the intellectuals are very fond particularly of impersonals. That's why you find it mostly in academic circles. But for the people in general, it, it doesn't resonate very much. Mm -hmm. So she says, intellectuals tend to impersonalize everything, possibly because they are too enamored with their brains and detached from their hearts. And later on, she says, they're clouded by their own cleverness. And she says, so they're so far behind in the race, they think they're in first place. <laughs> <laughs> that's nicely put. Yeah, that's very articulate. She it's says, really one, one more, one more. She says, I know lots of brainiacs who are so stuck in their own heads, they can't seem to get out of their own way. Super enamored with being the professor, they can't ever be the student can never surrender. That's nicely put. Just one point to add to it, just to be fair to him, those who, who go towards impersonalism. See, what happens is that some people think that the specific is sectarian. Now, if you are worshipping a specific deity, the others are not worshipping that. So you are worshipping Krishna, others are worshipping Shiva, somebody is worshipping Durga. Somebody is worshipping some other Ganesh. So they think the specific will make us sectarian. The specific and will do what? The specific... Make us sectarian. Sectarian. Oh, okay. Right. The specific will make us sectarian. And if we want to be non-sectarian, we need to be non-specific. And they think the personal is specific and therefore sectarian. And the impersonal is non-specific and therefore non-sectarian. So... It, it may also be see, generally one of the one of the characteristics of the imp, of, of in the, an intellect is to look beyond specifics to universals. So an uh, ordinary person will just meet another person. Oh, okay, I met this person. But then a uh, more thoughtful person will say, okay, where did this person come from? And okay, these people are like this. We, we draw inferences from specifics. That's the intellectual tendency. Newton saw fruit falling and he inferred the principle of gravity from that. So to try to move from specifics to universals, that is an intellectual tendency and that is a valuable intellectual tendency. But the problem here is that they presume that, that the specific can never be universal. So there is a, if you consider a negative axis in the material domain, the specific is sectarian. Uh, but that's like the negative y-axis. And then there's the zero point. But there's a positive y-axis where there can be where there can be both specific and universal. Krishna is a person. He is specific. Krishna has be, Krishna has specific attributes. He wears a peacock feather. He does not wear some other bird's feather. He plays a flute. But does that mean that Krishna is non-sectarian? No. Krishna loves everyone. Krishna cares for everyone. You know, it, it's almost, that's why Prabhupada would sometimes say that if we say that God cannot have any specific attributes, then aren't we limiting God? We have specific attributes and when we say God does not have specific attributes, we are actually limiting God. We are actually limiting God. So that's, that's the point. So if they, are, they can understand that, the, that there can be both personal and universal, then, then it's easier for them to go beyond impersonalism. Yes, please go ahead. I'm just looking at some of the comments. We have a lot of comments from Anjali here. Um, she's quoting you. 
Well, Britta also says, so the image of God is subjective to each living being's heart. Does this apply to all world religions? A difference in attractive hierarchy based on each individual situation. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay. Definitely there's a hierarchy. But that hierarchy doesn't mean that anybody is excluded. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, this is one of the, one of the fears in the material world that as soon as people think of hierarchy, they think of exclusion or exploitation. That, oh, the person at the top will, ex will exclude me or exploit me. But there can be hierarchy, which can also be inclusive and progressive. Everybody feels valued. Everybody feels included. Everybody feels loved. So that, that is the nature of yeah. And that verse in the fourth chapter, Bita Raga Vyakrada Manmaya Marapashito, mm -hmm. Prabhupada says oh, one of yeah. the greatest stumbling blocks to the personalistic aspect is fear, is fear of an yes. of a personal relationship with God. True. So, There's also the fact that, you know, we've all been hurt. We've all been hurt in the temporary material relationships where each partner is imperfect and not fully conscious of the sensitivities of the other and so we inevitably trample on each other's feelings we give short shift to the sacrifices they make for us and we're never really satisfied with the reciprocation that exists between one part of the lord and another part of the lord and so being burned out by the parts being burned out trying to align with other parts and being frustrated not able to achieve completeness want to give up on all personal relationships but you, you don't give up on all personal relationships. You just add to the two parts. You add the whole. You see what yes. I'm saying? One finger can't, can't have a lot of fun with another finger. But if you recognize that both fingers are part of the whole body, uh, then, then those fingers can have a relationship not only with each other, but with all other parts of the body, but through through the stomach, through the whole. Mm. So it's not that relationships are wrong, but it's fragmental relationships which don't take into account the supreme person, the father and lover of all have got to be frustrating. Mm. Yes, so true. Sometimes people who are very, as you said, hurt by relationships, frustrated with relationships, they may very vehemently proclaim, I don't need anyone. But... They strongly need someone to hear them when they say, I don't need anyone. <laughs> so, even the, re <laughs> the rejection, they want somewhere to hear that rejection. <laughs> we, we cannot really be, as I said, we can't be islands. Yes, some people can be, need, they need a little more space, they can be a little more introvert, but everybody needs relationships. Prophets, prophets say the impersonalists say this world is a dream, but they're very expert at enjoying the dream. Yes, <laughs> that is true. That's, yeah. It's, it's, it's like the rejection of something is also an assertion of its importance. Mm. Not always, but in this particular case, that's how it works out. The rejection of personhood is also an acknowledgement of personhood in one sense. Because an impersonal ultimate reality uh, doesn't do anything. So it won't reject us. Yeah. Uh, so there was a question in the... Uh, you see Zoom the question chat. in the chat? Zoom chat. Okay, I don't, I'm not seeing it myself. But if you see it, go ahead and address it. Okay, when the soul travels to the spiritual world like Goloka, does the Paramatma accompany the soul? You want to answer to Go ahead. Okay. So basically, the Paramatma manifestation is primarily for a purpose in the material world. So the Paramatma does not accompany the soul. The Paramatma manifestation is often the example is given that say if there is a sun in the sky and there are pots of water below, then in each of the pots of water, the sun will be seen as a reflection. But if there is the pot of water is no longer there, then the reflection will no longer be there also. But the sun will still be there. Mm. So the pot of water. Now this is often this in this example is often monopolized by impersonalists. But the principle is not wrong over here. The principle is that there is a, a 
there is one ultimate reality and that ultimate reality manifests in many forms in this world as the paramatma but when the soul is no longer has an embodied condition then that that like the pot is not there then the reflection also is not there at that time we talked yesterday about the whole material world is like in medieval times they didn't have walmarts down the street that were open 24 hours a day <laughs> you lived in a, you lived in a remote farming village and once a month or so the 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 bazaar would come to you you know there would there would be a field the merchants would set up their tents there'd be food booths and for one or two days a month you would be able to get everything that you needed but then at the end of that period of time everything would be packed up and it would disappear so it, it it's not there most of the time it, it, there's there's a period of time bef before its manifestation is not there there's a period of time after its manifestation when it's absent it's only there for a certain period of time so probably compared the whole material world presided over by narayan or the paramatma feature as one of these like temporary fairs that comes for a certain period of time it's it sets up to fulfill the desires of the local people but then it packs up and it goes away again so it says bhuta grama sevam bhutva bhutva praliyate this material world is not permanent it's bhutva bhutva praliyate it's coming and going and uh, the 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 vishnu the the purusha avatars um preside over this temporary manifestation of the material world and that includes um uh, garba daksha vishnu and that codes as well as siro daksha vishnu who is in the heart of all the living beings yes so the 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 problem is that while this is temporary we can either get attached to it or we can become averse to it and when we become averse to it we become averse to everything that looks like it yeah good so point. the spiritual world can look like the material world the spiritual personhood of god can look like the material personhood in this world and we become averse to that also that's why raga and dvesha both have to be given up raga dvesha vimukta istu krishna says bhukta bhoga parikya drishta dosh nesvarashu shum shama himisana when one gives up bhukta bhoga one first wants to in uh, bhoga one wants to enjoy the material world then being frustrated bhukta bhoga he gives when one steps away from both attraction and aversion shramahimi stitasya cha then he is truly stitch he's truly situated in his own mahimi his own glory and greatness as a constitutional servant of the lord yes do you see any more questions there i guess the questions are directed directly to you not to everyone on the chat I see I know I don't see anything else. Okay. Um my old friend Vishu Karma uh didn't think I gave enough of an introduction for you in the beginning. So the author of 25 books. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, um the creator of Gita Daily every day Chaitanya Charan our guest here writes 300 words. Have you done that yet today? <laughs> After this class. <laughs> <laughs> He's going He, he writes 300 words on the Bhagavad Gita and sends it out. I'm a subscriber. Um how many subscribers do you have to the Gita Daily? Well, the website gets about a million hits every month. Ooh. So it depends, I mean. I, the multiple channels of subscription are there, but by Krishna's mercy, it is serving a need for a small but significant number of people. All right. I'm one of them. I look forward to getting my Gita daily reflection and you can get um subscribe to that I believe on your website the spiritual scientist.com. Um yes. Ch Chaitanya Charan will be in Salt Lake City at the temple tonight if you're local. Um he'll be giving part 2 in his uh two-part series of the relevance of the Bhagavad Gita. I was there last night. It was amazing. I hope that they had gotten a good recording of that. um and we'll do so again tonight but if you're local by all means stop by the Salt Lake City Temple in Mill Creek um after RT Chaitanya Charan will be concluding his two part series um he will have his books with him you can get a signed copy of his book also what else what else should we share thank you bro for your kind words it is by the good wishes and blessings of senior vaishnavas like you 
that I'm able to be of some service. And it's such an inspiration to see. Last time when I had come, I was stunned to see the magnificent temple in the heart of Kuta. But now, not one, but two temples are manifested. So it's the expansion of the devotion of your heart in the architecture that is now spreading across Utah. So I'm honored to be on this forum and to be of service to you. Thank you very much. Too. You're such a giant spiritual personality and you're so big of an influence on in my own life that when you told me yesterday that the last time you've been to Utah was before the temple had been opened. Temple was opened in Salt Lake City in 2019. I was, I was stunned. That was three years ago. And it just seems to me that it was just yesterday that you were here. So big an impression do you make upon me. So I hope that you'll come back soon and that uh, you won't leave it for three more years until you come back. But even if you do leave it to three more years when it happens, it'll still seem like yesterday to me because I owe a lot of my devotional inspiration to you. And I'm sure thousands and thousands of people all over the world would say the same thing. Thank you, Chaitanya Charan. Thank you, Prabhu. I'm humbled and honored by these words. I'll try to live up to them someday. All Thank right. you. Hare Krishna. And thanks to uh, Vishal Karma, my old friend, Britta, for joining us, Sunita Joshi, as well as Anjali, uh, Britta, Brent, all on Facebook, uh, by Bobby, Jean, Eskelson. Um, thanks to all of you for jumping on um, Facebook. Mark Maros, also. Um, and then we had a whole bunch of people on Zoom, too many people to mention. Well, it was a great gathering, a great sangha, and it all happened because of the ability of Chaitanya Charan to bring people together around the unlimited ecstatic topic of devotional service. Thanks for joining us, all of you. Have a great day. Um, I know that Chaitanya Charan will be inspired in his Gita Daily essay today, and I hope that you all, in each and every one of your ways, are inspired as you go out through your day keeping Krishna in the center. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Rama, Rama. Hare. Thank you very much, Arbhushla Prabhupada Ki Jai.